Hello everyone and welcome to Babbel. I'm Megan Thomas and I'll be chatting to Gary Raymond today. Gary is a novelist, critic, editor, broadcaster. He's the presenter of the review show on BBC Radio Wales, the editor of the Wales Art Review, and if his most recent publication, How Love Actually Ruined Christmas, is something to go by, we could also possibly call him a professional party pooper. Hi, Gary. <laughs> Sorry for calling you a party pooper back there. I'm sure we will rectify that during the interview. <laughs> How are you? That's quite all right. Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's, uh, it's great to be chatting to you. Where are we sat today? Where are we virtually Virtually, virtually sat. Well, I'm actually sat in uh, in my study at home in Cardiff, um, trying to get as squeeze as much light out of the dreary day as possible, so you can actually see me while I'm sat here. Um, I've I've scooched up to the window, so uh, I'm trying to get some light in. Yeah, we have we've made the rookie error a couple of times of doing an interview too early, and the the British sun has not yet shown its face sometimes <laughs> by nine o'clock. So You've got a certain a certain window to do interviews like this in, uh, <laughs> yeah, haven't you? Of about forty minutes at midday. Otherwise, <laughs> exactly, and if you get the timing just off, you've got the sun shining right on you, so you've really got to time it properly. Um, have you been at home the whole of lockdown? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, there was after the first uh, UK national lockdown, um, myself and my wife managed to um, to run off to West Wales for a week to a cottage that had that was even more isolated than anything we'd experienced before. So there was no um, no Wi-Fi, there was no phone network. It was it was great because work. You know, you, you listed off some of the things that I do as part of my um, part of my portfolio of jobs, I suppose. Um, so during lockdown, you know, in the last nine months or so, um, I've been, you know, more busy than usual. But everything's been, you know, online. Everything's been, uh, you know, the, the the new landscape of Zoom. You know, everybody knows about Zoom now. Um, so um, so it was nice to get away. But yeah, pretty much just in this room. It's nice to be by the window. I'm normally the other side of the room. <laughs> Change it up a little. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's almost like being outside. <laughs> uh, you've got to you've got to do what you've got to do to make it more exciting. And so, I'd love to talk a little bit about your non-book career and um, uh, the kind of uh, presenting you're doing, the critic, the critical stuff that you do, the editing that you do. How did that all start? And what's been the journey up till this point now, where um, you have your various various titles? Ah, my various titles. Yeah, well, well, it, my my non-fiction career, I suppose, as you could call it, which I suppose up until now culminates in the book that we're here to talk about today, <laughs> yes. which is a very peculiar set of circumstances, a strange journey. But um, I suppose uh, we, I I started out. I mean, I've you know I've I've written and wanted to be a, a writer since. Um, I, I mark it back to about since being about eight years old when I wrote um, a ghost story for a school project, and um, and I've always wanted to do it ever since, really. So it's been that kind of ongoing thing. But but it was always important to me to be part of a wider group, you know. And so grow, I'm from Newport, growing up in Newport, um, you know, th th there was there was always a case of you know Saturday afternoons would be sat in the pub, uh, and we'd be talking about um, books and films and albums, and you know we'd be having those conversations. So. We we there was myself and, and a few other writers who were who were sort of in that group and um, we we were finding more and more that we wanted to write about these things and we wanted to um, emulate you know um, uh, writers that we looked up to and publications that we looked up to uh, you know like the Paris Review or the London Review of Books or the New Yorker you know these great shining beacons of kind of um, uh, liberal nonfiction literature and. Um, we found more and more that we were finding it, you know, difficult to to be here. I mean, for many reasons, we were young and not good enough. I mean, that you know, that was something. Um, but also, um, Newport uh, is a place, you know, um, traditionally people weren't people weren't turning to Newport for the for the future of wealth <laughs> uh, that way. Um, so, so it, myself and a few and a few friends who um, we used to sort of drink and, and chat and, and talk at length with. Um, decided to, to set up our own platform. Um, we'd all written for magazines. Some of us had edited before. 
Um, some of us had, um, you know, worked on underground magazines and literature and cultural film mags and things like that. And some had worked in design and things like that. So, but we decided that um, in uh, 2011, that um, <laughs> the great soothsayers and fortune tellers that, um, that we are, we decided that the future was not in print and was going to be online. I know it sounds it sounds really strange <laughs> now that the number of people who thought we were mad in 2011, I don't know what that says about Wales, I'm not sure, um, <laughs> but the number of people who just thought, well, you know, the, 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 the internet and publishing online is a bit of a wild west and, and that's not where serious writers go to write. I mean, it seems very strange saying that now. But we felt that um, we just wanted to write about the things we wanted to write about. So we established Wales Archery was launched in March 2012 as a place where we could write, where we could bring in other writers we we liked and enjoyed. And um, it was a chance for us to, um, you know, interview um, artists we admired, you know, a chance to, to have those conversations. And that's essentially what it was for. It was a platform for us to, you know, talk about things and um, meet people and bring people in. Um, yeah, that's kind of what it was. It de it's developed into something. What we discovered pretty soon afterwards was that there was a, a hunger for that kind of platform in Wales. That um, other than Wales Arts Review, there was nothing around online. It was it was all you know literary periodicals and and um, you know there, there was a, there was a kind of landscape in Wales at the time when it came to nonfiction that that um, you know things didn't. Uh, selling huge figures and the, the magazines were, were there, there was a there was a perception that the magazines were sort of talking to themselves really and we wanted to 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 open things up not in opposition to that we stumbled into it um we discovered that as i say there was a hunger for it so over time it's grown and grown and grown we um we you know we have a business model and we get uh, public funding we draw advertising revenue we run sort of research projects um, in order to, to to bring money, and we still have, you know, an exceptionally small budget for the amount of stuff we do. Um, but yeah, so you know, we we we're you know we're now read by, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand readers a year in hundred and eighty five countries around the world, and um, yeah, so it's been a a strange a, a, a strange journey, and 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 really sort of doing that, being in my sort of early thirties and being a a part of that and now being the only founding member uh left um the others have gone on to do other sort of interesting exciting things um but it, it's because of wales actually that so much other uh, uh, other strands of, of what i do have come along including doing the radio show for bbc wales um which i've done for nearly three years now that sort of came out of making a name for myself i suppose as a critic and editor and, a, and as a um you know very, very much air quotes as an authority on on what's happening in the arts in Wales. I, yeah, maybe I, I I think of myself as knowing more than the average person, but it's there's so much so much goes on in Wales. I don't think anyone can really claim to be a true authority. Although I know a couple who know a lot more than I do. Do you do you think that there being a Welsh space for this kind of writing is important, or do, do you end up just reviewing um art from all over or do you try and keep it specifically welsh the the, the core of wales actually is is welsh and if, if <laughs> oh, everything we publish has a has a, a welsh connection um if a if a writer if a welsh writer or a writer based in wales comes to the review and says i want to write about i don't know the new don delillo which you know came through in the post for me this morning um they're not you know we're happy to publish that because it's not we we're not interested in in sort of narrowly defining what Welsh means, or and we're certainly not interested in uh, um, unending conversations about Welsh identity. Um, we did that in the, at the outset in order to kind of sort of publicly find out who it is we we are. We were we have uh, lots published lots of articles, had lots of conversations about what it means to be Welsh, and 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 frankly, you know that kind of stuff bores me, and and I think if it's boring me. Then it's most likely going to be boring um, our readers. Um, so, but for saying that, it's it's very important. I feel it's important. We all feel it's very important that Wales actually is there to give uh, to put a spotlight on what's going on in the arts in Wales, uh, and that's because um, on the whole, uh, Wales is ignored. 
uh, the arts and culture wheels is ignored in 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 I mean it's ignored in Wales. The arts and culture <laughs> of Wales is um I mean you know you look at um uh, the efforts of uh, BBC Wales, um, for instance, uh, I, I, you know, argue all the time there. I don't work for BBC Wales, but obviously my show is there. I argue all the time for more things to be going on, as does uh, my producer. Um, uh, but I don't think there's an I don't think there's a natural inc- inclination at BBC Wales um, toward art and culture. Um, I think uh, that's certainly the, the same in our national press. Um, Wales might. Be might have a have very loud politically radical voices and platforms, but I don't think, um, on the whole, that that naturally connects to um, art and culture. So, so the important thing for um, Wales Archery is that it is it provides that spotlight. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And and this this might be a bit of a um, silly question, but um, then you're not connected to other art reviews is is it just a name that you can pick it doesn't necessarily mean that kind of the london art review is linked to linked to the wales one there's not like a, a guild uh, yeah no, we're not we're not connected to anybody else i mean it's 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 interesting that um you know one of the things you have to do in order i mean this is sort of a slightly uh maybe not the most interesting oh no but it probably is quite quite interesting to some people but um that you can't if, if you want the 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 a national identity. If you want the name of a country, um, for instance, in the title of your business, you can't just go and do that. You have to go through a process with Companies House. You have to have letters of recommendation from official bodies to say that you know we're fine, fine with doing that. So if if, if I if I wanted to call it the, the Germany Arts Review, I would have had to have, <laughs> have, had to have got them, um, <laughs> got them, you know, some permission from some German uh, authorities in, in in order to do that. But um, but yeah, so we're, so we you know we, we we work with lots of other we work with lots of other organisations all the time, lots of partner organisations. But but we're not connected to any other um, to any other publication or journal. And and in fact, we 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 think that's quite important. You know, having multiple voices. Uh, the landscape of of public of uh, publishing nonfiction and criticism in Wales is very different now. To what it was when we start when we launched in 2012 and i think um that's got something to do with us as as being sort of the the first ones um out there doing things the way we were doing them uh, but i think also uh, that there are lots of other factors in that um in uh, uh how that sort of come about but um but yeah i think it's important to have you know different platforms uh, and not just um you know it's it, it's not like you know we are we, Platforms in Wales and outside of Wales, we are in competition, but we, you know, it's friendly competition. Mm. We're all trying to achieve the same things and and uh, create a healthier um, society through the conversations and debates that go on. Yeah, ultimately, all on the same team, just <laughs> doing different yeah. things. Yeah, we're all on the same team. We just, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean we don't give each other a bit of an elbow and the ribs every now and again. Yeah. That trick. <laughs> I don't know how far we carry that metaphor. <laughs> we're, not, yeah. we're not drinking at the same water fountain, but we are. <laughs> <laughs> throw them, all, throw all the metaphors in there. <laughs> um, so uh, next up, I want to talk about your books because um, they're they're great. I've read them, and your first book um, for those who came after you've mentioned before was a bit of a slog to get published. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, well, that that came out. I think um, I'm going to go for 2015, although it seems like about 50, 20, 2005 now or something. I don't know. It feels, <laughs> it feels like a very distant experience for those who came after. Um, it was uh, it was a, a book that, that that wasn't my MA book. Um, I did a master's in creative writing in 20, uh, 2009, uh, 2010. Um, and it, it wasn't. Um, it, it came out of there, but it wasn't my ME book. Um, and uh, you know, it's a it's a long um, literary um, uh, sort of dynastic um, epic uh, that spent a lot of time going around publishers. And I went through that, you know, that experience which many many writers have when they get to that stage where you get these really encouraging rejections. 
you know, um, it spent probably two or three years uh, with an agent uh, in London who, um, uh, in the end, I think um, there was a process where we were all going a bit blind with rewrites and things like that. But eventually, um, it found a home, um, you know, uh, in, an enthusiastic home, which was, which was, which, which obviously was great because you can get to that point where you you want that first book published so you can move on. It becomes a kind of stopper, you know, it becomes this quite complicated emotional block where you feel like you're progressing and emerging, but you still can't go around um, talking too much about, yeah, I felt anyway, talking too much about being a writer and things like that because, um, at the, you know, this is at the time when Wales Arts Review was um, kind of not existing and then in, in its infancy and, um, I was, I, I suppose, I was beginning to wonder whether, because um, you do kind of pigeonhole and categorize yourself in certain ways. I think, just like everybody else does to you, you kind of do that yourself. And I was beginning to wonder whether I was um, an editor rather than a writer. And of course, you know, in 2020, you look around and you can be many, many different things all at the same time. So I can edit the review. I um, have, you know, broadcast a radio show. I do, you know, a, a lot of. Um, a lot of things for uh, for radio, for Radio 4, Radio 3, things like that. Um, uh, and I do, you know, lots of things behind the scenes. And um, and I also write these books and I write lots of reviews and I write lots of articles. So, so the, you know, it's exciting that every day is kind of different. But back then, um, this was a big, you know, this was supposed to be my big statement literary novel of the writer I thought I was going to be. And um, people saw, I think... Um, Editors and publishers and agents saw saw a lot of potential in it, but didn't see a way to sell the book, which of course is you know their job and what they're interested in. And I um, appreciate that and and you know value it and admire that that role as well. Um, so so it, so uh, in the end, I mean it, it, it found its right home because I have a, you know I have a really good relationship with uh, Parthi and there who brought out my, the novel after that and uh, brought out. Um, uh, how Love Actually Ruined Christmas, and we'll be bringing out my next novel as well um, next year. So, um, so you know, I have a good relationship with Parthi, and it's really good to have um, to have a, a relationship with a publisher um, uh, where you know I have um, it's it's not it's not down to me, and it's not I don't make decisions, but it's nice to to have to be sat in meetings and have conversations about what the, what you want the cover to look like and what the blurb is going to sound like and um you know what media promotion you'd like to do and all these kinds of things um because i know i i know a lot of writers and i know that you know some writers they just they you know the manuscript gets finalized and then you know they just get told what's happening in those next stages they get told what the cover's going to be and they get told so 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 for those who come after was um was a big learning curve in in um uh, for me i'm very proud of it as a, as a as a novel still um i think about you know eight people read it um and, and, nine and, if you include me <laughs> that includes you and um oh, I see. <laughs> probably five times um so 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 really i mean the, the, the one thing it taught me as well is that um you know it's to not take any of these any of these things for granted which i absolutely most certainly don't um, and that every book could be your last because there's no guarantee that you have a career as such. Um, every book you write, um, I mean, it could be, every book you write could be the last one you finish. I mean, every book is, uh, from a right, writing point of view, every book is different. Um, every book uh, at, so far has been a very different experience in writing. Um, but, you know, as I say, for those who come after, is a book I'm very proud of. Um, uh yeah, you know, I, I think I think it's a good book. I think, um, you know, as, as a, I'm proud of it as a debut novel. Um, so, but as I say, it feels like a long time. It doesn't feel like a book I wrote. It feels like a very different person wrote it. But. Well, uh, there's some great um, foreshadowing there because you ba you basically wrote it for those books that would come after. Um, <laughs> a starting point because I mean, this story does really uh, set us up well for my next question of. So then why a literary thriller next? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, um, the, the book after that, which uh, came out in 2018, which I, I suppose if I've had any kind of breakthrough so far, it's been that book, although it's, you know, in very relative terms. 
um the golden orphans was um i was out um i'd been out for a beer with my uh publisher uh, uh, a party um in cardiff i was still living in newport at the time and um we kind of got got into a conversation where um i spent a, quite a bit of time in cyprus where the novel was set many years ago i'd never really strangely it seems strange now but but I'd never really thought about writing um, a novel about it. Um, and my my publisher had just been on holiday there, and he came back and said, "Oh, uh, so we were discussing it." And he said, "You should write a book about." It. And I told him some stories. You should write a book about um, about Cyprus. And it was strange because I'd never thought of it. And it was ten years before I'd been there, and uh, it was ten years prior to that conversation, I should say. Um, and uh, the moment we started talking about it, it, it seemed you know kind of obvious. So so sat. We had like two or three beers and sat there. Um, my publisher, Richard Davis, uh, kind of said, um, he kind of laid down the goal and he challenged me. He said, well, um, if you can write a thriller, a literary thriller, um, kind of like, I bet you can't do it. You know, it's not as easy. You know, it's not easy. Obviously, it's not easy. I know it's not easy. Um, uh, you know, but if you can, um, if you can do it, then um, uh, let's see if we can publish it so it was kind of a bet but there, there were there were other things as well they were like well i've got a gap on the list next year or, um for a book of around fifty thousand words in you know a gap in the list a gap in the budget um so he said you know make sure it's not more than fifty thousand words so i kind of went away and spent a weekend sort of mapping it mapping it out and um uh, my uh, now wife as well was there um with me and she was like responsible for some of the you know some of the main plot ideas of the book, you know, I was kind of knocking these things around. She would say, well, what if this kind of happened? And what if they did this? And, you know, they were these great, like, light bulb moments. <laughs> it was really fast. I wrote it, um, the first draft, in a few months. Um, and Parthian loved it. And um, that kind of changed the way I I looked at, um, at writing fiction. or the, It created new possibilities, really, to, to, to write a book, um, I, the, one of the problems with for those who, who, who come after was um, that I found in the years it took me to write it were um, was was structural and were, were plot based difficulties. So this new process of mapping something out and then sitting down and just like hammering away at it for you know six weeks or whatever it was it took to write the forty nine thousand words I think I got it at um, was was a was it felt like a real step up. That kind of discipline, that kind of drive and focus, um, felt like a real a real step up, and and that's you know that's a similar kind of focus I brought to the to the Love Actually book, and a similar kind of focus I ended up bringing to the the novel that's coming out next year as well. And so, yeah, that, that next up, <laughs> the Love Actually book. I mean, if if you'd told me that only one of your books was written. Um, based on a conversation at the pub, I probably would have assumed it was the Love Actually book. <laughs> is, is it an argument you've had in the pub enough times that a book was possible? <laughs> um, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's pretty much how it went. I mean, I I spent years, um, I mean, it makes me sound like a bit of a bore, but um, I spent years um, with the idea rattling around in my head that a book about Love Actually would be good fun to do and would be good fun to read as well. Um, and really, it's my lockdown book. I mean, uh, well, it's one of two. I mean, the novel that is coming out next year, I also got around to writing during lockdown um, or, you know, sort of putting together and finishing during lockdown. Um, but, the, the yeah, the Love Actually book is a culmination, I think, of years of um, every year around about Christmas. At some point, there will be a... A conversation, a rant, a argument. Um, a lot, no, not an argument, because most people that I know agree with me on it. Um, <laughs> um, but so, so, so in a way, it's kind of like I feel that the book um, is me nominating myself as spokesperson for everybody I've ever spoken to who hates that movie. Um, <laughs> but again, I mean, the, the actual book com comes from um, a conversation with my publisher, and, and I said like. Um, I, you know, I, I, I just literally said to him, "Look, um, let me do this Love Actually book, and we'll put it out for Christmas and make a million bucks." 
Yeah, I was going to say it's it's a good, certainly a good a good thing to release just before Christmas because it's perfectly sized for a stocking. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, you know, I didn't want to. I didn't want it to be like you know the Cambridge history of Welsh literature, which <laughs> my laptop is currently propped up against. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, it needed to be. I I, I had this idea, and and I, and I I I nicked the idea from Jeff Dyer. Um, who's two, you know, really good books, um, which are essentially like uh, um, commentaries on two very, very different films, one of them being um, Tarkovsky's Stalker and the other one being um, Where Eagles Dare, the, the Richard Burton, Clint Eastwood uh, war romp. Um, and he wrote those two books um, essentially as documents that you can read and enjoy while you're watching the film. And... and um, I always felt, with all respect to Jeff Dyer, who I admire a great deal as a, as a writer, I always felt that that he hadn't quite nailed those two books. There was something, um, there was something that where where in in areas he was he was trying to to do um, a little more than the films allowed him to do on a personal level, and um, and I I just always felt in the back of my mind when I read those books. Um, over time there's something in the back of my mind that's like that would be a great format for the love actually book to just sit down and watch the film and write out my responses um which was essentially you know hell. so I, I said to him said to my publisher look i'm in lockdown I'm, I'm looking at my workload i reckon i could put something together for you uh, and, and and my thinking was um watch the film write a response it would probably be like i don't know ten thousand words or something like that um eight to ten thousand words and put it out as like a christmas pamphlet like a festive uh, you know little pamphlet. really get everyone in the mood by destroying yeah, you know, it, it was supposed to be kind of like people do enjoy that kind of humor you know that kind of um slightly bedraggled depressed angry humor <laughs> it's always been quite successful in this country um in particular um mm. but um so i thought well that's the book that's that that's the tone that is calling to me um, and I thought, you know, it could just be a little pamphlet, the sort of thing you see, you know, next to the till as you're checking out in a in a bookshop or an art centre or, mm-hmm. or 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 wherever. Um, and I thought, you know, it would be fun to write. And um, and and I also felt that um, what I wanted to do was write something that was fun, that was um, uplifting, and um, that people would really enjoy. Um, because I, you know, more and more I was thinking about. You know, just lockdown and just what a you know absolute shit show twenty twenty has been. Um, like every year, getting slightly worse than the year before. <laughs> like every year, you go, "This must be the worst year ever." And then <laughs> it goes, "Hi guys, I'm here." Um, so um, so you know, I was kind of I wanted something that was gonna you know make people laugh and um and i uh, the feedback so far i mean the book's not out but i uh, quite a few people have sort of read it and got and, and just said how much they've enjoyed you know laughing they've laughed at it and that was very much what the idea was i said to my publisher i could write this it'd be funny let's stick it out um so when um so he said great go on go for it let's just do it um so i wrote it and sent it to him and um and it, and it and it you know it, it grew when i was writing it, it the format began to to take hold a little bit more and it began to grow it began to grow into something and i thought well if this is like a book which is a scene by scene commentary so you know if you open the book it has the you know it it designates which scene you're watching and you can read through the book as you watch the film um uh, i began um i began realizing well i need to contextualize this so you know i'll put a i'll write an introduction just to let people know where i stand and why i'm writing it and why you know, Christmas, you know, put, sort of set out my stall, you know, that I'm a big fan of Christmas. I, you know, uh, I'm a, one of those Christmas people. And um, uh, so it's important to me that films like Love actually, you know, aren't um, elevated to mythical status because it spoils Christmas because the, it's a terrible film. <laughs> you shouldn't, it's not even a Christmas. Anyway, let's not get into that. But it's not even a Christmas. <laughs> it isn't even a Christmas film. It just happens no, to be over Christmas. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, it's just a... F- I mean, if Richard Curtis can write a terrible film and go, well, let's just set it at Christmas, it'll make a million bucks, then I think I'm well within my rights to follow <laughs> suit with the book, to be honest. So, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, so again, it was just, you know, I, 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 you know, literally I was getting up at like five o'clock in the morning, putting the film on, 
watching like 15, 20 minutes worth with the pause button while I made notes. Um, and I did that for like two weeks and then I wrote them up and sent them to my publisher and, um, and you know, it was all go. It, 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 and it just all moved so quickly, getting the cover done. I mean, so, so, so sometimes you work on a project and everything falls into place because it just feels quite right. And it was it was obvious that the cover was going to have to um, ape the, the the famous poster with the red ribbon and, um, you know, the, the, the title kind of wrote itself and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, having like... Um, uh, Lisa uh, Smithstead, who's um, uh, a friend of mine, but is a brilliant film academic, film scholar, Dana Exeter, and um, wrote a wonderful um, forward for it. Um, uh, I had a great editor in uh, David Cottis, who um, I, I, the, the book's got a lot of footnotes. And when I sent the book, I thought, I thought, I, I don't know how people outside of academia feel about footnotes. I mean, I know we love that Nabokov did it, and we, you know, we love all that kind of stuff, but. Um, uh, you know how much for a book like this are people going to like footnotes? And and David, my editor, um, my, his first email back was like, "We love the footnotes. We need more of them." So yeah, I, I love the footnotes, especially because they they read like asides, yeah, you know, rather than being in the text. And oh, you, the, it is a truly hilarious book. I mean, the fact that you refer to Richard Curtis as the Woody Allen of Hammersmith actually had me. <laughs> rolling around laughing um and I just think you've really you've hit the nail on the head being absolutely scathing without actually being too negative it's a very happy book because it's so scathingly funny and yeah you've you've really got the balance just right there and I do think it'll make an excellent Christmas present um, provided, provided we can all get into shops and they don't count as not essential. <laughs> we, I, we I think we could argue this book is essential. If it means <laughs> yeah. anything um, in 2020, anything that makes you laugh should be put down as an essential product. Yeah, sell it in boots. <laughs> get, it, <laughs> get it in the in the aisles. It should be part of Rishi Sunak's recovery plan. <laughs> yeah. Government should buy a million copies in hand. Post, posted with everybody's. <laughs> That's a great idea. It's fascinating because it seems like anyone who thinks they love Love Actually will still agree with all the points you made. I kind of, I'd never even thought about it for more than 10 seconds. It's just something I watch once a year. Um, and then it's and then it's done. Move on to the Grinch or the Polar Express or whatever it is that's on my list. Wow, well, they're going to be my next books ready for next year. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you a list of all my favorite things that you can prepare for next year. <laughs> no, this, could this could be a very good, very good relationship. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do, I do love the irony of the fact that in order to write a book about a movie that you hate, you have to watch that movie really intensely. <laughs> so yeah. that's your punishment. <laughs> it wasn't. Um, yeah, that was. It was just hard. It was exhausting, um, emotionally exhausting. Um, nice chunks. I went. I went through like eight TVs, which I threw out of the window. <laughs> going to buy new televisions. Um, it was, yeah. I mean, the the thing is that we kind of live in an age of um, of, uh, of 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 certainly a worship of nostalgia, but but also in an age of of reevaluations. I think most definitely, and uh, because things are so easily accessed in order to reevaluate things and quite often i i find myself looking at something that i've seen before and thinking and feeling very differently about it be it a book or a film or or an album or something um uh and it's not very often that, that something is consistently at a level throughout your life i first saw love actually i mean it came out in 2003 so you know it's it's 17 17 years old i doubt i watched it when it came out but it's certainly not long after um uh and the number of times I've seen it, um, my views on it, if anything, have become more concrete. They become more entrenched, and um, and I think you know some of the writers who have who have who I sort of cite in the book and footnote in the book who have brought elements out of the film that I hadn't recognised or didn't know about before have only served to 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 emphasise what an absolute terrible piece of trash this film is. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember where I, mean, I started with that, but this happens. You see, I, you ask me a question about love, actually, love, actually, and I start off 
with your question and I go off on the, <laughs> into my own like sort of aural footnote. <laughs> Your and diatribe. Started, which is kind of the book, really. That's kind of the, how the book works. <laughs> In fact, you needed this book. You needed to be able to let it all out. <laughs> no, I, that, yes. For the audience, this is a very, very good book. I, As someone who thought I loved Love Actually, I didn't actually realise how problematic it is as a film. Um, it's just, so maybe... Uh, maybe don't read it if you don't want to, but actually, no, read it anyway because it's very funny. And it's out on Monday and you can put in your Christmas stockings. Oh, I bet everybody knows at least one person who rants yearly about how much they hate the film. So it makes a perfect Christmas present for them. <laughs> and yes, so thank you for joining me here today, Gary. It's been great chatting to you. And yeah, I really, I don't think you're a, a professional party pooper. I do think your book is very great. And yeah, thank you for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you to our audience for watching. Please tune in and for next time and like our page and subscribe and share things and do all those good social media deeds and i'll see you next time bye